This message is part of the teaching provided by House on the Rock Fellowship, a church caring for the Miami Valley region. Before you listen, be sure to access the notes in the download section of the message page. Have a Bible ready. Thank you for being our guest. So thank you so much for having us and thank you for coming. Um, Sometimes the church get boring place, then people don't want to come anymore. So, but when you get there, that's when you die, and you think you're still alive, because the Bible encourages us as the day come close, the end come closer. You need to have more fellowship, and the Bible is not talking about Zoom call. It's talking about. <laughs> You know, it's talking about face-to-face, hugs, and, you know, mostly hugs <laughs> and hugs. People got to be together, and you got to fight for that. You cannot lose that. Once you lose that, you have lost everything. Um, some time ago, there was a, a missionary guy. His name is Richard Wilburn. He started the Voice of the Martyrs. He was in a conference of pastors, many but all pastors in the country, and the new communist regime leaders. And they were sitting in the front. I can imagine he wrote about it. I read it. But I can imagine the big guys with high ranks sitting in the front like a god. And every pastor would get up, take a microphone and say, thank you. The communist is going to walk with the Christians. We're so happy. Everybody rose and just praised them, praised them. And his wife, who was sitting with him, Richard, said, that sounds like everybody standing up and spitting in Jesus' face. What are you going to do about this? Then he told his wife, if I get up and speak the truth, you're going to lose your husband. Then she looks at me and say, I don't want to have a coward husband. <laughs> so he got up. <laughs> so you, yeah, so you want to you wanna lose me? Okay. I'm not afraid. I was just doing it for you. So no. Nope. Don't be just a coward for your wife and kids and the family. So he spoke up and said, the communism has always against the Christianity. You are the murderers. You have killed a lot of Christians. And this is on radio. The speakers, the people outside listening, the whole parliament is making the biggest decision that will ever lead the country. This is a Romania, I think. And then, well, he went to jail for 17 years. When they released him, it was the Church of America that fought for him to get out. So the communist leaders approached him and they told him this. Don't you dare reveal the secrets. Don't you dare talk about what happened here in a prison. Because he was tortured. And then he looked at me and said, for 17 years you didn't kill me. What makes you think you're going to kill me when I'm free in the U.S.? Because he was coming to U.S. Then they told him, you don't understand America. They're so easily deceived. We can blackmail you. We can make up stories. And they will believe us. We can say you are a rapist. They will believe us. Or we can hire a gang for $1,000, they will kill you. So be careful. He's like, well, let me worry about that. So the first thing he did, he wrote a book called Tortured for Christ. <laughs> yeah. If you want Tortured for Christ, you don't buy it. You can just order that online. They will send it for free through the voice of the martyrs. You get to hear the stories. Probably the story you need to hear more than I can tell you today in this season because it's coming your way. It's a time you need to stand. And the silence will be a sign of defeat. Don't forget I told you that. Only in the U.S. you can speak up. 
Only in the U.S. you can still fight. Only in the U.S. you can make things happen. Every other country has been locked up. You can't do a thing. You can't give a second opinion. But we are still preaching the gospel. They don't want it. But we can't help it. That's what Peter and John told them. They said, don't speak in that name again. They said, well, we could try. But when the man told you, I can't help it. It's more like I need to go to a bathroom. You never ask for permission. You just go, right? <laughs> so that's how the calling feels like. Nobody say, hey, I'm going to a bathroom. You don't ask permission. You just run because you can't help it. When a God calls you, you will know. That's the sign. You don't even need to tell anybody. You just go. But anyway, let's get back. I don't know why I told you all that. <laughs> it was none of my notes. Like I always <laughs> speak my notes. Uh, so I have a Kenya Rwanda Bible. Kenya Rwanda is another language. So I want to give this to you guys as a sign, you know. The first one I was not that spiritual. Anyway, this is to remind you God speaks all languages. And with your money, we buy a lot of Bibles, we hand it over to people, they can read it, and they God understand when they talk. It's amazing. He confuses with the languages, but he understands them all. That's the cool thing about God. So what can you give Americans anyway? Just a Bible they can't read, you know? <laughs> uh, because you give a lot. But this will be a sign that you are supporting people. They're getting the word. They're bringing it back to you. Actually, they're bringing it back. Someday, you're going to see people coming from Africa with the word. They may not bring money, but they will bring the truth. So let this be the sign. I'm going to give this to the pastor because he's the coolest guy in the house. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your support. Really, we appreciate your support because that's why we are still there. Otherwise, world partners will have to say, come back. The funds is out. But we still have funds because you do that. So thank you so much. So you saw the video. These are the stuff we do, cool stuff. The Probably every one of the people you saw there, they were hopeless, most of them. I can start with one with a heavy voice, like with, with the guy with a heavy voice. He's the journalist on the radio, and he's famous journalist. So let me tell you about this guy. If I want to speed and the police will not you know, give me a ticket, I take him with me. <laughs> That's how famous he is. Because he lowered the window and said, hey, officer, my name is Eddie Camoso. He said, oh, it's you. Keep it going. You're probably doing the right thing. <laughs> so I'm a bad guy. Okay. <laughs> that joke went wrong. That means I speed. Okay. Anyway, so <laughs> Eddie Camoso, a famous guy, singer. Uh, he's got a good songs. I wish I could play that for you. I met him on the radio. He was preaching and with me just on the same stage, but he was saying things that make no sense. So I asked him to have a cup of tea. We drink tea, you drink coffee. So it's all the same, it's all dark. Doesn't really help much, it's just a habit, okay? So we go to the restaurant and I told him, you know, like he told me, <laughs> just order anything you want, I will pay. So. I haven't seen him for almost 15 years. And we sit on the table. He ordered salad. We were like four guys. We ordered nice food. We are eating, but he's not. He's just watching his salad. He said, Eddie, it's a salad, you know? So it's not going to get cooler or anything. It's just salad to eat. He won't eat. So finally, we pushed him. But every time we tell him eat, we started talking. We are not paying attention, but I realize I'm always paying attention. You just don't know. So he will look away, wipe off tears, and come back. 
Then I realized, this is a crier. This guy is a crier. And they never met, you know. Guys are like that. They don't exist in Africa. So I decided to go to his house to visit. I did. When I went there, it was a ghetto. It was a very nasty place. People have been killed in that area, you know, for the phone. You carry a cell phone, they kill you, they take it. Just things like that. So 6 p.m., he's in the house, locked up. That's the neighborhood he lived in. So I, I asked him, can I just help you out? Can I take you out of this place? He's like, oh, sure. sure. We packed everything, took him to a better place. I pay rent. I knew the guy's in the trouble. So we became friends. But he's watching me. Everywhere I go, he goes with me. And then I came back and to ask him, Eddie, I need to know something about salad. What happened to the salad? He said, I knew you are going to ask me this someday. Because you were watching. So this is a common to most people in Africa. Lockdown is still on. People don't walk. They don't get help. How they survive, it's a miracle. So this was even long before COVID. So you understand it's not even a COVID. It's something else. So he was watching salad and think about his wife and the two boys who are not going to eat that night. So he felt like he's going to betray them eating. He will look away, he will cry, but he doesn't want to cry in front of men. So the rest of the guys didn't know he was crying. And by talking about that, he began to cry again. But he's so grateful for the things that he think I have done for him. I only pay $300 for three months. And it was a nice house for him. He, thought I was really powerful, but the most powerful thing, he's traveling with me. He sees what I do. I don't even know what I do. I just became part of my life. I meet people on the street. We talk. I don't know how I start a conversation. Then it, the next thing you know, they are repenting. But, you know, that's, anybody can do that. There's nothing special about me or Apostle Paul or the other Paul. You know, there's nothing special. We're all human, right? <laughs> so that's, that's Eddie. So now he's got a studio. He's recording new songs, uh, making some money. He survives on that. We set that up. And we're helping more journalists, more media people, singers, at least to point them to Christ. Uh, so that's a... One of the big things we do, otherwise we meet people in the village who don't know how to read or write, so it's very common. The other guy would like to tell you, this is your testimony, okay? Because some guys go, some guys stay, and you know, some die, the other ones survive. <laughs> but I will invite you to come, though, you know, I will protect you. No promise, though. But. <laughs> <laughs> Don't me. Just come, you know, I'll show you how we survive, if I will still be alive. So, <laughs> so then, we, we go on the radio, we speak on the radio, we pay this radio for like a $400 a month. $400 a month, the human rights, now I'm going to tell the story of the bad guys called the human rights. Do you know those organizations? Yeah. Very dangerous people, yeah. Human rights, you think they care about humans, but we know their story. You don't get to know, you don't need them. You never interact with them. So they, <laughs> they come to our radio show, they want to advertise human rights in our show, they will pay 3,000, okay? We pay only 400, they're paying 3,000, why? Because they want to advertise a secret society called LGBT. That's what they want to advertise. You might think that is gender, just new species. <laughs> now you go to hospital, you pick up a gay. 
not a boy or girl. Now it's offensive. I'm becoming more offensive because I said there's some people who are called the boys and the others are called the girls. That's offensive? Go to hospital, stay there the rest of your life. No one else is going to be born. Just those two. If somebody lied to you, you are born that way, I have a good news for you. Be born again. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> be born again. That's how it works. Then you will feel the power of being human. You will be a man or you will be a woman. Nothing more, nothing less. That's how it's been a thousand years. But you could be a victim and be part of that and you think it's your gender, it's your right, your freedom. But you are being used by somebody who's being used by somebody who's being used by somebody. You never know the truth. So where we are, we experience the full measure of their power. It's not about gender. It's not about climate change. <laughs> they are up to something you don't understand. Why am I saying this? Because you're being fooled. The church come together for no reasons. You hide behind the scriptures and songs. You think you are paying your way to heaven. That's not how you go there. You may actually stay. You have the truth to share with the people who are perishing. If you're not doing that, you are like those bad guys who are hiding the medicine of cancer, Ebola, malaria. They have it. They can cure that, but they're hiding it. Are you going to judge them? They work for Satan. Lucifer, you know that guy? But you work for God. You have the truth. You're not giving it away. They are perishing anyway. So who is the bad guy now? So we are all all right. We need to meet. Like, let me encourage you this. Guys, the church need to meet more often in small groups. You need to talk about politics. Don't try to be too spiritual, okay? Because that's not America. American people make things happen. That's your calling. You can pray. If you want, you can pray. But you have to make decisions because the rest of the world have no right to make decisions anymore. See, if you don't do that, you are selling out the world. Yeah. You need to meet and talk. They are meeting right now. They are talking about you. They are talking about how to kill you, how to close your mouth, how to shut you down, how to shut down in the churches. But you're not talking about anything, and you're pretending to be spiritual. That's really what bothers me. So one of the president, the hero, just one of my favorite president in Africa. Can you imagine there is a, my favorite president in Africa? There is actually one. His name is Thomas Sankara. He was not a Christian. I don't think so. But here's what he said. He got killed for speaking the truth. But he said you can now carry out a fundamental change without a certain amount of madness. People who don't get angry change nothing. If I don't make you angry, I can't make you happy. Because people are looking for happiness. Just give me happiness in envelope. I want to just, you know, that's why people are raised on TV. They're always watching movie. There's now Marvel. The new Marvel is coming. You are never satisfied. That's why you come to church. You're so bored. There's nothing more entertaining than the movies we have. I'm telling you, it's a very dangerous season <laughs> we're living in. And all these things is played out in front of you so they can brainwash you. Hollywood. Have you heard about Hollywood is silencing people now? Yeah, because the truth is starting to come out. There's a guy who used to be your president. He came up and stole things up and left. <laughs> now you're in the trouble. <laughs> he stole things up. And now the truth is starting to come out. Wait, well, this is who I am. The way I see things, the way I say them. If you try to hide and be so spiritual, carry a big Bible under your arm, showing people how spiritual you are, it's not going to change the world. They will tell you to stay home, you will. But don't let them take your guns, please. 
I know, I know that's what I'm waiting. When Americans hear that we're going to take your guns, you're going to fight because I know you love hunting. You don't even know why you... <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time you don't even know why, how powerful it is to have a gun in your house. You don't know why. You think it's for hunting. No. That's not what it is. It's a fight to shoot people. You read the Bible. There is a lot of shooting. <laughs> Have you read the Bible recently? Or you just moved to New Testament, you don't care about the other one. There is a lot of shooting. And the people have studied the Bible. They decided, we are, don't, we are going to create a nation that no one can defeat. We are going to arm the people. We the people, not the government. It's the most powerful thing the government has ever done. Now, if they take them away... I'm saying goodbye. I'm not coming back here. Because the door will be closed. Nobody can get in. So I'm encouraging you, carry your guns everywhere. The bodyguards have got too many. You have received too many Africans. Now you need to carry guns. <laughs> Thank goodness. Some partially true. So, let's get spiritual again. Let's go back to the scriptures thing. So I want you to make disciples. But don't deceive yourself that your many, your church is doing well. Some other churches are not. You're actually doing fine. You're doing great. Man, it is one of really churches that I know they're doing good. Just by looking at you, you look great. But it's not enough. I mean, you can give me money. You can send me to Africa. If I die, you will stop sending money. But <laughs> Americans need to be saved. Well, I can't promise you to get your money back. But it happens. So one of those guys, you know, uh, my, my best friends. Actually, let me talk about Melody. Melody, the, Melody is a very short, this short. She's probably 50 years old, I think. Never been married. She's got one eye. So she's very short. That's the problem, right? Short, one eye. So I met her 20 years ago when I got saved. I pushed her so hard in the middle. You can do something. There's a something. God created it for more than just silence. I pushed her to do evangelism. She can't. And then I realized she works in a hospital for they're specialized with the bones. They heal bones. And I don't know what that means, so I didn't care. Just do something, Melody. Prophesy. I mean, you can do something. So I push her, Melody. She has so many complex. She came off. Ten years later, I asked her to go to YWAM and do discipleship at training school. She did. God spoke to her. She went to become a missionary in Burundi. She quit the job, the good job. She went to Burundi. She's serving people there. She's preaching on the street. Basically, she's becoming more, you know, open. But she still has some complex. So her mom, when she was little, she lost her eye when she was very little. Her mom told her, you will never get married because of your conditions. She kept that to heart. So a couple of years ago, we go back to her hometown. We visit her mom. A mom who has some level of dementia, she forgets so easily. She forgets her. And I'm thinking there is no hope here. What are we, we going to make her confess or what? So Melody goes, you know, I, I send her in a room with her. I say, you're going to make her confess. I don't care if she doesn't know what she's saying. Just make her confess. A blessings to you because she cost you when you were little. They go in the room. They spend an hour. They come out crying. He, she told me, Tewo, can you believe this whole time she never forgot anything? She remembered everything she said to her. And then she turned. She's a Christian. She's always been a Christian. She laid hands on a melody. She prayed the devil out of her. <laughs> and when melody came out, she was so free. Then she told me, do you know what else? I don't need a husband. It's like, what? 
That's your main top list in our prayer request. Like, no, I thought I needed a husband to fulfill me. Now I'm okay the way I am. Now if you meet Melody, she will give you testimony. How long did that take? Almost 20 years. That's a discipleship. But you got to keep pushing. You don't give up on the people. You keep pushing. I give up on some. Some are very too crooked to just keep pushing. So anyway, I, some get better. That's Melody. Melody now lives in my home of there. She's a Congolese. She's born in the Congo. She lives in my home village and now saving the world. She's a specialized, you know, with, she's a therapist. She grabbed these kids. She goes knocking in doors and because, how do I say, it's a long story. It's a powerful story, though. Because there is another kind of people, Rwanda never cared about, the handicapped children. If you had a handicapped child, you kept them in a house so your neighbor doesn't know you have a kid. Because it's kind of shame, they thought. So Melody, I don't know if the Holy Spirit wakes her up, go knock on that door. They kick out, get out of here. We don't want you here. Because they don't know what she can do. But when she healed one kid, one kid who could not eat, so crooked, the hands could not move, Melody straight her up and the kid began to eat. They will bring them overnight to her. I have one too. I have one too. So she became a healer in the village. These kids will come out of the house looking like a yellow banana because they never meet the sun. So Melody takes care of those babies and little bit adults. She fixed them. And then their parents get saved. She discipled them. That's what she does. Don't you think that is my hero? But when she talks about me, she thinks I'm her hero. I'm thinking, okay, let's be hero to each other. She sent me a message about last week. It was so amazing. Tell you, well, I never thought I would be loved. You're the person who really changed my life. I'm thinking, Melody, you changed my life. I don't know what you're talking about. But that's how discipleship looks like. There's so many stories I would like to tell you. But, oh, my time is running out. So, can I tell you one more, just one more story? I'm African. We tell stories. <laughs> you know? I guess we are not smart enough to tell you a lot of theology and tell you how long it was from Egypt to Israel. Maybe that will set you free. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, people are just so smart. They hide behind the smartness. They do nothing. So, very serious though. The very serious case. The, the knowledge we have, we do nothing about it. Maybe we make money out of it, but we don't make a life out of it. But we study the Bible so we can bring people to Christ. If we're not doing that, what, why do we know what we know? So my friend, the pastor, I, uh, he listened to me for a year. Then he calls me and says, come, come visit. I go there Sunday morning. So he gives me the, his church. He said, this is your church, and now you take it. You do whatever you want with it. We know you're speaking the truth, but we don't know how to do what you do, so take it. You're the bishop now. So he called me bishop. I said, that's not what I do. Give me five people. So I trained five people in his church. Next time, he brings 11 more pastors from different denominations because they are seekers. Then the next thing I know, they are going in a village preaching the gospel, raising you know, people from a wheelchair, including a mayor who was handicapped in a wheelchair. So the healing is taking place in so many ways. These pastors are just very poor pastors, uneducated. Then they go to the office, the office of mayor, and he was on a wheelchair. They say, you know, we can pray for you. You can be healed. This is like a try. I have tried so many people. The witch doctors have failed. What do you think you can do? In the name of Jesus, they get up. They pull him out of his chair. He's still walking to this day. He left the office, became a preacher. What would you do in a government anyway? 
they don't preach the gospel. <laughs> so, I mean, so he left. Um, I don't know why. There's something good. Our government is better than yours anyway, so. Because yours, you can't even be sure who you voted for. <laughs> so, uh, for us, we always know, you know. We always, if we even know who's going to win. We always know. For you, you just messed up, right? <laughs> Sorry. That was, that was a true joke. <laughs> Somebody, you know, need to make up your mind. Uh, it's, we have one president, and he's great. Know your president, ours. So, so those are a few stories out of sacrifices. Some of us, we go. Some of you, sender, you're the senders. You give the money. Some of you pray. Pray. You need to pray. You need to pray for us. Because at some moments, I don't feel like praying. I can't pray. I just can't. I sit down and get angry. So if you visit me and you find I'm always angry, I'm not angry at you. I'm just angry at injustice that is happening every single day. And we're dealing with that every single moment. And when we come here, look how fun it is. I'm talking to the most smart people on the planet. They don't even believe it, but you are. There is no other powerful country on a planet that can do what you do. The most powerful organization that help people, the needy all over the world, come from the U.S. The other countries have given up. They don't care about humanity anymore. The church in the United States is the only organization left to do something. Your government is stopped, right? They used to do good stuff. Now they're out to kill us, sending bombs on us or providing machetes to kill us. <laughs> you don't even believe this. Your government does that. They do genocides all over the world. They do. It just depends who is the president. I'm talking about politics again. <laughs> You're going to be offended, but you know, you can say he was just an African guy. He's not coming back. <laughs> If somebody say, you, you say something bad, it was just an African guy. He's gone. It, it's, it's really shocking because I, I get into trouble because I dig deep. I try to know the truth all the time. I'm trying to know the truth. I'm always asking him questions to the people I'm supposed not to be meeting. If I find a politician, I'm going to ask you questions. I got to know what you know, everything. Because I need to know what's going on in the world. So 2016, I met a General Romeo Dallaire, who was in charge of the UN soldiers in Rwanda during genocide. I asked him, why didn't you help us? Then he got up, like, Shh, you woke up a sleeping giant. Finally, somebody asked him the right question. He began to tell me a lot of things. We met in Canada. And he told me, I called everybody. I called Bill Clinton. It's almost like, let me blame him. I'm going to tell you what he told me. So he called him, and I need 4,000 soldiers. We can stop genocide. Bill Clinton tells him, why do you care about those blueberries anyway? They're overpopulated. Blueberries, black people. But the same people will be asking you to go on the street, black lives matter. Do you think they care about black? And I've seen the churches on the street supporting that demonic organization. That is not us, people. We don't have a black, we don't have a white. We have the body of a Christ in one color. We don't buy into those nonsense stuff. You have to be angry about what's happening, what's taking place in your country. When this LGBT movement you hear here, you think, oh, it's okay, they're just people like us. There are no people like us. They've been deceived. They have been compromised. They don't love you, even if you gave birth to them. 
They are being used here, but overseas they are very generous. They know what they are doing. They are political. They are politicians. The political movement, they call it LGBT. You think it's just gender things? No. They are up to something you don't know. You need to be asking questions. You need to get angry about what's happening. These people kill my partners in the ministry because we're talking about the things I'm talking about right now. We can't help. We can't tell the lies. We can't be silenced. The only way to silence me is as a bullet in the head. But if you miss. <laughs> if you miss. Thousands are going to be saved the next day. But if you kill me, 10,000 will be saved that week. That's just reality. If you kill one of us, thousands will come to Christ. I don't know how it works. It's almost like a kill me so people can come to Christ. It's like that. Because people realize the lie behind the bullet. Why do they want to silence you if you're in a free world? Why do they want no other opinion? Because theirs matters, yours don't. What is the church? Are we preaching about heaven, like we are going to heaven with a bus? We are waiting, we are just on a bus, a station is coming to get us. Oh, you believe we are going to live with these people the rest of our lives? So we need to know how to survive this life. We need to talk, people. We need to talk. We need to get together and talk about them. Talk about Republicans and the Democrats. Yep. I see you're so afraid. He said the thing. But I know after, you know, church, there is lunch. Sometimes you got what you call potluck. I don't know what that is, but it involves food. <laughs> there is a meat in it. Yeah. But some of you are wearing blue, in the heart, of course. You know, others are wearing red. You know each other. You hate each other. You don't trust each other because one is a Democrat and there's another Republican. I know you very well. I studied you. I know your constitution more than you do because I studied you. So I can tell you the truth. Do you really love one another? Well, look how beautiful you are. This is a beautiful family. But some of you just celebrate every night because of Joe Biden and the one. The other ones are crying. We lost our Trump. <laughs> you do that. And you're Christians. But you don't want to talk about it together. This is the vision designed just for you. You must know what you're following. These things that happened in 1993. I watched it happening in 1993. The churches were praising the government. Yeah. Government, our president, woo, the best. The best, this is the worst guy on the planet planning genocide to kill us, but we are praising him. What happened when the genocide happened? The pastors have been put in places. I don't know, you guys seem independent. I guess that's why you're free. But there's something called denomination. That is a big, okay? The big guy tells you what to do. You, yes, sir. So they don't like your pastor with his speeches. They remove him. They send you another one, a retired military guy. That's what it happened. And then the military guy is in the control of the church, and you don't even know it because he, he can. These people are actors, they can cry in a camera. You think they're so emotional, they love you. They are the most evil people I've ever seen. They can cry for no reason. I have seen a guy interviewing Trump when he was running for president, and he cried in a camera. So, what are you going to do with the women? Who did abortion? Are you, are you gonna put them in the prison? And the people are like, oh, Trump, the evil person. Trump, you're bad. 
Why was he crying? He was a man. Why was he crying? They got a genius, people. People cry for no reason. They are actors. So emotional people get carried away. You buy it. You think they are right. And then the pastors took a megaphone, walked around in the village. People of God, come to church. Nobody's going to touch you. We did. Some of us did. That's why I'm still alive. I didn't go. No one will survive in the church. They will bring them all to church. That's why pastor was there. To spy on the people, to test their emotions. They will come to confess their sins to them. So he knows their crime. They killed them all. My home village of 50,000 people, there were 300 survivors. Some of us because we didn't go to church. Nobody was controlling our emotions, so we took off running every single day. I'm telling you the same thing. Run. Don't close your mouth. Ask questions. Make things happen. Most importantly, one thing I want you to leave you, preach the gospel for any cost. Whatever it costs you. I know you love your jobs. You're always afraid to lose it. Well, the Hollywood actors begin to lose it just because there is one I saw because he slept in a, in, a, in a Trump Tower. He spent a night there. He got fired from Hollywood. What's up with the Trump guy anyway? What happened to this guy? Who is this? <laughs> I don't understand America. I'm still need to, I still need to learn about that guy. What happened to him? What is, what's up with him? That people are persecuted because they like him. So I begin to like him because they hate him. <laughs> you can't love a guy everybody praises. Something's wrong with those guys. I'm not politician. I'm a Christian. Always be. But things out there we need to talk about. So... I'm closing. I'm closing. I'll let you go to your own businesses. Uh, watch your footballs. <laughs> Football games, I know it's big. They told me, they warned me about it. So I want to think that you're going to survive because someday you're going to die. I have a bad news for you. Everybody's going to die. But some will die for no reason. They will have been dead just waiting to be buried because while they are alive, they were not living for real. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I can make you angry, but I didn't do a good job today. You don't look angry. But I hope I can really make you angry. Like the guy in a nursing home in Greenville who tried to stop me from playing worship songs. I let him know. I study karate. <laughs> I'm going to kick your backside. So <laughs> I actually scared him that way. Then I looked at him. He's so scared. You know, these people are scared, but when you scare them, they are terrified. So he was a big muscle guy, satanic, you know. He doesn't want anything a Christian happening in nursing home. And then I'm standing there thinking, let me show you how to scare big guys. So you know my whole life I've been in training to beat somebody. You touch that radio boy, I'm going to show you something. <laughs> he bought it. <laughs> he bought it. <laughs> you know? He believed me. He was just confident. About, okay, this guy could crush me. But I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you. You don't touch that radio. <laughs> so... He kept telling me, you can't play music in a public place. This charge a thing. But you know where that company was? It was a brethren's home. The church company. He said, you can't play Christian music. But when I play Christian music, the elders, our beautiful people, our grandpas there, we took care of. They felt like back home, like old days playing hymns. They felt like they were in a church. It doesn't matter what pain they went through. They went to sleep. It helped me. 
It's a church company. So I told him, this company was started by a church. I will do whatever I want. And see what you're going to do about it. So I began to preach. Oh, people got saved. They were, oh, my goodness. I can tell you stories, and I remember time is out. I can tell you. Right here in the U.S., people are getting saved. Even a couple of weeks ago, two people got saved the way I preached. Three weeks ago, four people got saved in the other church. You should get saved too. That's what we're all about. People need to come to Christ. So what happened? This guy, he kept making, he, he stole up the other employees, the pagans. They began to make cases against me. Take them to the supervisor. I would go sign papers every time, like four times I decided, you know what? I had a too much. Who's doing this? He said, we can't tell you, I'm sorry. I know who he is. <laughs> I know who that is. But, so, final story, the last one, I'm going home, okay? I worked second shift. And I ended 10 p.m. I'm going home. I'm so tired already. I went at 10 p.m. You're thinking about bed. You don't even remember you have a wife and the kids. Think about the bed. I'm so tired. And God told me, get in this room. I walk in this room. I stood there. I said, God, I've been standing here. I don't know why you called me to come here. 97 year old raised his hand and said, Can you help me? I went to her and said, How can I help you? She said, could you lead me to the Lord? I thought, are you sure? Yeah. So I prayed with her. I went home thinking she had an Alzheimer, dementia. She didn't know what she was talking about. The next day I go back at 2 p.m. Her family is there visiting. And when I, I showed up in her room, she screamed. That's the guy who led me to Christ. Last night I thought, yes, you are alive. You knew what you were doing. People are waiting that much. She died that week. 97 year old. Are we going to let them die without knowing Christ? Just because the guy scared us. Fear must be defeated because he's a liar. Okay? So how many of you want to receive a Christ today? Yeah. Okay, those are saved. They're just joking. <laughs> I'm talking about people who want to accept the cross as Lord and the Savior for the first time. I want to pray for you. It's not a magical thing. Just raise your hand if you want to be saved today. Nobody? You're all saved? How many of you have already done this? I'm going to see the hands down. Okay. I, I just always do that because, but what's next? Because the family I preached to last time, they got saved, the four of them, they came to my table in the back and they said, so what now? What do we do next? I said, that's the best question ever asked me for the people who received the Christ. So I'm starting discipleship with them. But I realized in a church, you don't have anybody who's a trained to train. How many of you have been trained to make disciples? Nobody. Then you're not going to do that. Sign up on a table, we are going to make this happen. If you want to make disciples, I'm setting myself up. It's locked down anyway. When we go back, I'm going to be doing this online. People must make disciples. So let's pray. Father God, I know these people have been listening. I know this is a beautiful place, a beautiful church. I pray that your power will overcome over all their fears and let them speak. They cannot be silenced as a sign of defeat. This is not a defeated church. So I pray you touch every one of them, Lord, and bring them back to life and bring more people to life because these ones are alive and well. Holy Spirit, I pray that you take over from today. People will know you because the house on the rock, they know you. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for sharing your time with us, and we'd love for the journey to continue. If you're a guest, would you consider reaching out to us? We would love to come alongside and encourage you in any way that we can. If you're someone who's joined us today, and you are desperately reaching to find hope wherever you can. Again, Jesus came that we would find hope. 
you can find hope today. If you want to send us a short note, a member of our hope team would reach out quickly, promptly, to come alongside and see what we can do to encourage you in whatever storm you might find yourself in. That's why Jesus came. That's why we're here. Jesus said there's two ways to live your life. And a wise man, a wise woman, builds their life on Jesus' instructions. God bless.